I think one of the things that we try to hammer home is that this is going to be a cycle. I think the Fed raising rates and interest rates rising is going to you know, raise the cost of capital. It slows down growth. Then you have a situation where you go into a normal slowdown. Now, the timing of that has been unclear. I think a lot of folks have been early and some point we're going to see a slowdown and you're going to see correlations return to normal. And over the long term, you'll just see the cycle continue to, to yeah. work itself out. Welcome to the Active Advisor Podcast, brought to you by Harbor Capital. Join us as we learn from pros who have helped thousands of investors live better lives. I'm Brian Moore, and I'll be chatting with some of the brightest minds in the financial advisory business, bringing you insights on practice management and investment research that works for advisors and their clients. Welcome to another episode of the Active Advisor Podcast. Joining me today, we're thrilled to have Compson Silipachai, CFA. Based out of Austin, Texas, Compson is currently a partner at Sage Advisory Services, an independent investment management firm known for its expertise in traditional fixed income, ESG, and global tactical ETF strategies. Before becoming a partner at Sage, Compson served as VP of Research and Portfolio Strategy, where he played a pivotal role in macro strategy, asset allocation, portfolio construction, and ESG considerations. Prior to SAGE, Compson spent nine years at the Teacher Retirement System of Texas as an investment manager in its asset allocation group. But Compson's interests also extend beyond finance. In his spare time, he's passionate about exploring Austin with his wife and daughter, volunteering with retired racing greyhounds, and he's also a mentor through Partnerships for Children, helping foster youth transition to adulthood. Welcome, Compson, and thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Brian. This one's a special for me because I know you personally and I believe I actually first met you when you were at uh, Texas Teachers. So we've known each yeah, other. Yeah, we go before. we go way back. Um, Got to ask, how about those Rangers? I know you're you're kind of a Dallas area of you know sports fan. No, I'm thrilled. I mean, anytime we can bring a championship in a major sport to Dallas, uh, you know, gives me a year of bragging rights. Even though I'm not a giant uh, MLB fan, you know, more of a football basketball guy, but. Uh, no, I love seeing it. I have a lot of friends uh, from Houston. So um, that was a really nice, really nice W for us. So no, it's uh, I'm thrilled about it. Well, given that we know each other personally, I'm really looking forward to the different directions that uh, today's podcast is going to take us. But traditionally here on the Active Advisor, we like to get things kicked off by asking each of our guests, what's the first memory you have related to money or investing? I have a few. Um, well, you asked me the first memory, but I'll I'll talk a little bit about you know when I was a kid. Uh, I'm from Thailand. So I was born in Thailand, Bangkok, moved here when I was seven years old. And I remember after a few years after I moved here, um, you know, my mom and my aunts were just like freaking out about the exchange rate, um, the Thai bot exchange rate, you know, versus the dollar, you know, obviously like they're, they may have had some, you know, friends with, you know, um, obviously in Thailand. So, you know, purchasing power really went down. And I, I just remember that being like, a point of stress for them and never put two and two together. But now like flash forward, you know, a couple decades plus um, that was during like the Asian financial crisis back in 98. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting to like, look back at your memories in different context. The other more on the investing side, um, I, I was in economics class in, in, in high school and we had a, an exercise where, you know, we'd, have to go in and like buy a stock, you know, just to learn what it was and learn about investing. And at the time I didn't know anything about markets. Um, but so I just like look for, you know, the most interesting stock in the market at the time. And, you know, the things that the thing that was dominating headlines was WorldCom. So I just like was like, hey, you know, the price is low. So it was like a penny stock at the time. So I just put in my entire like imaginary capital in that. And uh, I think like I made like a 5X on it, you know, in whatever the semester, because the penny stock went from like a quarter to like a dollar twenty, you know, it was something crazy like that. And, you know, we took those snapshots at the perfect time. And so, no, it's it was like my version of being like a meme stock um, guy, but, uh, you know, 20 years before it became a thing. I think that's really, though, kind of looking back where the meme stocks got kind of, you know, started. I, I mean, I can remember going, um, 
I was totally a separate story, but I was purchasing a car in, in Minneapolis and the, the, the salesman came up to me, oh, did you buy X? And I'm like, what? What, what stock are you talking about? Oh, yeah, I'm an active trader. And you're like, oh, OK. <laughs> like, oh, man. When was that? Ah, uh, God. I mean, it was it was late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. So that was like a kids came off a bubble or in the bubble. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's um, I do think like the the most recent episode of, you know, kind of this boom in personal investing really started like when, you know, when all the brokerage houses dropped their fees to zero, you know, they all went to that Robin Hood method or Robin Hood, you know, um, like model. Um, and so people could just trade frictionless. And so it became like a casino. You just pump in a lot of stimulus and, and here we are. So no, it's, it's been very interesting, uh, four years. Well, now let's hit the fast forward button. Can you tell us a little bit more about your journey? heard a little bit already and got sure. us the timeline of events that led you to your current role and the work you do uh, today. For sure. So, um, you know, I, when I went to college, um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, but I wanted to, you know, do something that made a solid living in terms of a stable job. And, and I'd grown up playing, um, a lot of games, you know, I was a competitive player in a game called magic, the gathering. It was like a card game. Um, and so I really liked the strategy. I like kind of the, um, you know, just the, the way that, you know, I solved problems through, um, de developing a plan and then there's an element of chance as well. So there was kind of something that interested me about magic and other games like that, that, you know, was kind of a similar thing for markets. And so in college, I just continued to lean into that. And I went to Texas A&M um, major in, in finance, um, and, you know, joined all the clubs that, you know, had to do with trading and investing. And, and so, you know, you know, would join like trading competitions and Forex trading, you know, model portfolios and just like playing around with my friends and just read a lot of books, read as much as I could, uh, you know, um, checking books out of the library about, you know, investors, books like market wizards, one of my favorite books that really kind of influenced me um it is a book called when genius failed which is a book about long-term capital management um and that was one of the first books i read about markets and it really piqued my interest in in just the whole space but it was a fixed income um you know focused book so that was kind of my start in in that in that area um and so when i left college um it was really the eve of the financial crisis. And so we didn't have, you know, a lot of options, especially coming out of Texas A&M. It wasn't a pipeline school to to Wall Street. You know, we definitely had folks that went, you know, to, um, to kind of the bulge bracket firms, you know, based in New York City and things like that right out of school. But obviously those opportunities, um, you know, were, were more scarce than they were in the past, in the mid 2000s. And so, I really lucked into a great opportunity um, to intern at, you know, Texas Teachers uh, in Austin. At the time, it was a huge pension fund that it was undergoing a transformation. So um, brought in a new leader um, at the time, um, and Britt Harris. Um, he was also a professor at Texas a and So, you know, that's how I got, you know, got to know him and got to interview and got the internship and, and there at Texas teachers. And I, you know, one of the best things about, about, you know, an institution like that is that you're, you're a global investor in nearly every asset class and you also can do it at scale. And so I was able to um, really explore, um, you know, the, the, the gamut of, of what institutional investing on a global basis looks like. Um, and so when I graduated college, um, I stayed on um, in that role in the asset allocation group. Um, and then after I joined that, you know, Texas teachers, two weeks later, Bear Stearns collapsed. So it was, uh, it was definitely a trial by fire in terms of, you know, market volatility. I, I didn't understand the magnitude, you know, to me, like it felt a somewhat normal, um, you know, because I didn't, I didn't have a normal, I just, you know, I, you know, 2007, summer of 2007 was when I interned, I started kind of on the eve of the financial crisis. So I just didn't know what was normal was abnormal. But looking back on it, it was just like the most harrowing time mm -hmm. in markets, you know, in all of our careers. Um, and so navigating that, seeing kind of, you know, what we had to do um, to 
in terms of reorganizing the asset allocation um, in the midst of of the GFC. Gained I gained a ton of experience. Then you know I moved over to trading where I met you, um, and you know learned about how markets worked, not just from you know more of the theoretical side, but just where the rubber meets the road of how you know buy side um, participants you know, brokerage firms, broker dealers, um, other types of buy side, the entire ecosystem, so to speak, learn how that worked, um, which was really enlightening. And then, you know, really kind of over time just fell into fixed income, mainly kind of the rate side and, and ended up on the asset allocation team focusing on that. And then, um, from there, you know, I really leaned into, into that knowledge. And then, you know, Sage advisory at the time was hiring uh, in 2016 was hiring a um, portfolio strategist um, focusing on macro. Um, And I thought it was a great fit. You know, I knew a lot of the folks here. Um, And so I moved over here, um, you know, about um, seven years ago and, you know, it's been a great, uh, been a great match, um, you know, and, and been a great experience. That's great. No, it's definitely, I kind of forgot that, you you know, I guess you did really kind of start your career during the GFC, which um, for a lot of people, I think, who have come after really kind of haven't sensed, uh, I guess, one of those seminal moments in the marketplace. Um, you know, so I'd really like to to take that that was your kind of beginning time. And, and that was kind of when you you know, were drinking from the firehouse about the markets uh, mentality. How has that that kind of, I guess, chaos um, has that lent any added value or any kind of added knowledge to to kind of what are some of the areas and, and how you're looking at constructing portfolios and, and kind of looking at the big picture nowadays? Yeah, I think, um, you know, um, one of the benefits of going through that period, and I don't even call it a benefit. It's just, I think it's, it's just a consequence of going through GFC and a post GFC period is that having started my career in 2008, you know, I was really a child of this zero interest rate policy. So the operating system for investors, you know, after the GFC was one of, you know, huge kind of central bank intervention. So, you know, um, whenever we had a slowdown, you know, we had quantitative easing, you know, rates were at zero, eventually at negative in some countries. And so that was kind of the normal um, course of action for us. Um of that generation, you know, now we're in a totally different period where um, we're really in really uncharted territory. Not only are we at higher rates, you know, people have seen higher rates before, but we're also trying to unwind this, you know, situation where central banks and and central governments have been a huge part of the markets. And I wouldn't even say unwind, we're just trying to rebalance it to a normal level. And so the operating system going forward is going to have to change. And so, you know, I think how it's really affected me is just kind of, you know, having to reorient some of the you know thought processes that you had, you know, in, um, you know, the 10 years post GFC to, to today. Um, but one of the benefits is that, you know, during that post GFC period, everyone had to know, you know, how the Fed operated, you know, that, that reaction function, you know, you got to know really what, you know, what the tools um, were and then how to interpret them correctly, you know, and then also, you know, at a second level, understand how the market would respond to it. You know, I think that's a skill set that's really widely shared by market participants today, uh, especially, you know, folks that, you know, are kind of managing a lot of money. But I think before GFC and even, you know, in the 90s and 80s, it, it really, it seemed like, you know, not, it, it wasn't like, you know, standard knowledge, you know, for, for folks, it was, it, you know, it's a price of emission. Now you have to know, you know, what the fed is doing. You have to know, you know, how, you know, a change in QE policy and, you know, um, change in interest rates affect other asset classes. It's just the price of entry at this point. Um, whereas I don't think that was the case 25, 30 years ago. Um, so, so that's, that's my long winded answer of, of kind of how, how it's kind of, you know, affected me here. No, I think that's good. I mean, it, it definitely is. Um, yeah. I think, you know, we were all back then thrust into that fire because I had started just, you know, a couple of years before that. And, and you're right. You didn't really kind of, um, it was kind of just, you know, throw another couple of logs on the, on the, on the fire of knowledge and, and learning. And, you know, you had to assimilate it pretty fast. And, and, um, and, and I think it helped change a lot of us who kind of started our careers around that time. Um, 
transition this into an air sage and you're kind of, you know, in your, your current role, what are some of the areas that Sage believes are cornerstones to solid portfolio construction, um, yeah. especially kind of in this changing? It seems like we're also kind of doing a little change now. I think the cornerstones for us, and this kind of goes across all asset classes. So we we have majority kind of fixed income um, strategies, but we also have multi-asset strategies, equity strategies, but ultimately really the pillars for us in terms of portfolio construction um, the first thing is that we like to look at risk and, you know, portfolio metrics from different dimensions. So I think it's really important to look at, you know, not just the the risk of your own portfolio, but, you know, what is the tracking error to, you know, your benchmark? Um, and then where are the risks coming from? So, you know, not only, you know, your weights, um, you know, your differential in weights between your sectors and styles and, you know, duration and credit and things like that, but also, you know, break that down to another dimension of, of different factors. So things like, you know, momentum, value, growth, you know, and, and fixed income could be quality and things like that. And I think that's really um, important um, to know, kind of t- t- to view risk from all those different dimensions. And then from there, um, really um, having another view of your portfolio of when the risks break down. So I think that, you know, a risk model works on average, but, you know, during black swan events, you want to have a situation, you you want to have a portfolio that is, you know, or or you want your process to take into account, you know, what would happen to your portfolio in, in tail events. And so we do a lot of work on scenario analysis, scenario testing, um, both on hypothetical scenarios, as well as historical scenarios to see what our portfolio would look like when a lot of these, you know, tracking air assumptions, you know, when, when, when you have like a VAR shock, so to speak. And so that's really the first cornerstone is to to look at your risk from different dimensions. And the second one goes in hand in hand, with what I said about scenario testing and tail risk is just humility. I think ultimately, you know, models are, I think there's a saying like all models are wrong, but some are useful. You know, I think, that's really something that we take to heart because um, we're in a world where you're seeing, you know, things that you can't model um, really, uh, you know, um, come to bear every couple of years. Um, you know, I talked about the post GFC period. I think unconventional central bank policy was one. Um, obviously, a pandemic is one, you know. You know, I think there's a lot of in politics, you know, there's an overlay of, of politics today. And and there's just a lot of things that, you know, um, are just you just can't model. Um, and so I think we try to take into account, you know, kind of the context of of the markets in relation to, you know, the inputs that are, that our models are giving us. Um, in terms of risk and things like that. And so those are related to things. It's it's looking at risk from different dimensions and having humility um, and, and understanding that your models will be wrong. But, you know, so using common sense to kind of, you know, um, take the inputs from your models and use them in a proper way, but not have to, you know, not not treat it like like dogma. And that, that, that's just our process. But is there any personal thoughts you have that, that, that you'd like to add on regarding, you know, structuring a multi-asset portfolio? I mean, I know Sage definitely, and you have a large input in that, but yeah. I know Sage is definitely kind of looking at things at, at all levels, say the 30,000 foot view all, all the way down to the one foot view. But, um, you yeah, I would love to hear if you have any personal thoughts on, on that as well. Yeah, I think um, today it's, you know, I think we, we're in kind of an interesting period because, um, you know, pre, pre-GFC, we had a higher interest rate period, obviously. Um, asset allocations or from the largest institutions to just a, you know, a, a normal retirement portfolio, you know, had a much, had a much higher weight to traditional asset classes because interest rates were high such that you can earn a 7% return just using publicly traded asset classes. Obviously the sophistication and markets have, have risen since then as well, but fast forward to, you know, the zero rate regime where, you know, this, you're still trying to earn that seven percent, whether it's in your retirement accounts or or your pension plan. But now you're starting at a zero percent treasury rate, and so that's that leads to more aggressive asset allocations. Maybe even not not even aggressive. You're taking more risk in different areas. Maybe you're taking more liquidity risk through private you know, alternatives and, and private markets. 
Um, you're taking on, you know, more leverage and things like that because you have to compensate for the fact that yields were at zero. So now fast forward to today, you're at 5% treasury yields or 4.5%, you know, today, you know, gyrates uh, 50 basis points a week, but, you know, let's call it four to 5%. Yeah. You know, a lot of those kind of that, the thinking that you had during the zero rate regime has to also shift. Does it go back to, you know, just using all traditional asset classes and, you know, your 60, 40? I don't think so, but, you know, you can't use the same playbook as you did to earn 7% um, in 2015 as you do today. And so I think for us, it's like when we're working with clients and, and thinking about structuring portfolios for the long term, um, you know, at a 4%, 4.5% 10-year rate, you only have to earn, you know, 2.5% of risk premium over that in order to, you know, over time in order to gain 7%. You know, back 10 years ago, it was, you had to earn, you know, call it 5.5% over it. So you have to take on more risk premium. And so um, I think that, you know, my personal belief is that, you know, you're going to see a big shift into more traditional asset classes. You know, I think fixed income is is certainly um, going to have a bigger role in in portfolios going forward, especially at these yield levels. Now, I'd love to kind of touch on a few things that you mentioned, but I'd love to hear really kind of you started to 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 allude to it and mention it. But what are some of the general tones of, of the conversations you're having um, with advisors, and are there any common themes? Obviously, you know. So just from listening to you, I think one of them would be kind of what is it we have to do to achieve that that kind of target 7%. Um, but that really forces a lot of people out of their comfort zone where they've been investing for the past 12, 13, 14 years. You know, how are how are they struggling with or are they struggling with that? And and how are you working with them to solve it? I think um some of the concerns that you know we're, you know, some of the concerns that folks have um on the advisory side really post COVID has been just the rate of inflation and its effect on, you know, financial assets, particularly because, you know, that's what we do, but really all facets of, of like someone's financial picture. Um, But, you know, in terms of financial assets, you know, you're seeing correlations really break down. So, you know, equities and bonds are moving in tandem. Um, And, you know, this year you're seeing a situation where, you know, there's been a ton of bond issuance, rates have risen, banking stress. And so I think all of that is a consequence of, you know, higher than trend inflation. It's been really persistent. The Fed has had to to react and, you know, therefore you're not having portfolios behave the same. And I think um, a lot of advisors are scared and a lot of investors, you know, outside of, you know, financial advisors, you know, from the largest to to, um, you know, the smallest investors um, are afraid that this is going to be the state of things on a go forward basis. And I think one of the things that, you know, we try to hammer home is that, you know, this is going to be a cycle. I think, you know, the Fed raising rates and interest rates rising is going to you know raise the cost of capital. It slows down growth. You know, then you have a situation where, you know, you go into a, a normal slowdown. Now, the timing of that has been has been unclear. You know, I think a lot of folks have been early. You know, and but at some point we're going to see a slowdown, and you know you're going to see correlations return to normal. And over the long term, you'll just see the cycle, you know, continue to to yeah. work itself out. And so I think what we try to do is try to keep you know the view very long term. Because when you look, when you're staring at, you know, 2022 and the turmoil and financial assets, um, it's, it will mess with your mind. You know, it's, it's a very hard to see those types of losses, especially across all asset classes. Um, but I think, you know, you're at a, you're at a higher yield level now. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunities on a go forward basis and, and, you know, saving is actually, um, it's a really, it's a really kind of ripe environment for savers on a go forward basis, um, and so we're just trying to keep that view long term um, when we're talking to advisors. Yeah, I like it. Um, 
Yeah, I, th- I think it's it's funny as we're approaching year end to it's always kind of one of those where um, as portfolio managers, just people who are students of the markets, we always look back at the at you know at, that was the beginning of 2023. Obviously, we came in kind of with a different expectations and a different slightly different mindset. Um, but as, as we're kind of approaching year end, hopefully a couple of weeks away from the market, giving all of us some time off. What in, what, in your opinion and kind of Sage's opinion, does the next six months look like for the fixed income space? And kind of how are you going about, you know, working this into the perspective of the conversations you're having, but also positioning uh, other portfolios? I know you mentioned that, you know, you don't want to necessarily think short term um, having those those longer horizons. Uh, is that really kind of the focal point? Or I'm sure there's probably added things that you guys are positioning for. Do you see any different areas you know that that are advantageous yeah i mean i think over the next six months um i i, I do i mean that's like the trillion dollar question it's um but <laughs> i know i kind of put you on the spot there i apologize no, but you it's know, fine it, it's, it's one of those um i think we all kind of look back and you know whether you're in technical analysis or whatever you're kind of looking back and you're going okay we hit here 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 um i do agree with you we're due for some sort of something i don't know what it is to return us back to a normal cycle or maybe we don't get one i don't know i'm kind of scratching my head at this point uh, if i had hair i think i would have pulled it out but uh, i do think there's probably areas um you know that that where if we are or if we are looking that three to five years out for for advisors and clients what are some of those that we believe in and you know that are going to be good places now we look back and kind of go oh man i should have held on to that or should have added to it yeah well, I mean, I think, you know, ultimately the level of yields makes everything cheaper, especially if income generating assets. But, you know, just to go back to the next six months, I mean, I think, you know, we're in a period now where um, the expansion this year and the resilience um, this year in the U.S. economy and, and therefore, you know, assets have really been largely due to, you know, the the stimulus programs during COVID era and it's kind of working and it's, you know, kind of um, emergence and then working its way through the system uh, this year, there's been a, a, a massive kind of fiscal deficit um, in an expansion, which is very abnormal. And so that's really helped kind of counteract the fed, you know, QT program, you know, the rate hikes of yesteryear and then some this year. Um, and, Going forward, you're not going to see that level of fiscal stimulus, we think. And so we're going to be in a period where you have um, liquidity withdrawal from central banks um, through continued quantitative tightening. Um, You're going to have liquidity withdrawal from the federal government through issuance of bonds. Um, You're going to have, um, you know, liquidity withdrawal through lower bank lending um and you, any any type of lending you know activity is really dropping off a cliff obviously after you know some the regional bank crisis and so you're seeing a drain on liquidity that could be used to like stimulate the economy or to be used for economic activity or investing activity um and so the next 6 months we think we're going to see the effect of that um and so you know how do you prepare for that you know we you know obviously you have a long term plan that you want to want to stick to but if if you do have flexibility you know be a little bit more defensive on growth assets so things like you know equity beta we're taking a little bit lower um you know we like bonds currently because we think that you know the level of yields not only give us you know a, you know if we do go into a slowdown it should you know bond prices should appreciate but in a in a drawdown you're not coming off of like a 1% 10 year you're coming off a five percent ten year, so that kind of self healing period just it's a lot quicker in terms of any drawdowns you may you may um, experience. You know, investment grade bonds you're you're earning upwards of six percent um, in terms of, of of yield, and so you know I think that you know that's kind of how we're positioned and and messaging uh, that to to clients and and in our kind of external notes as well. I'm glad you mentioned external node because I want to highlight uh, that you are also the author of Sage's weekly market commentary notes from the desk. So one of the things that I get whenever I write something internally, and I'm sure you get as well, is are there any specific tools, resources, or thought leaders that you rely on? Um, what is it you know that that if you could share with us some of the things that you kind of focus on when you're constructing that note? 
Well, you know, I think we, um, it's a weekly note where we're, you know, we're really trying to just update our subscribers, our clients um, about, you know, kind of the, what we think is most interesting. And I think the difficulty in, in, in writing, especially in kind of our world is keeping things succinct. You know, it's easier to write a 40 page white paper, you know, explaining like the ins and outs of mortgage backed securities than to write a one pager talking about, you know, what they are valuations and what we see on a go forward basis. Like I find that so hard, you know, so um, that's, but um, ultimately how I go about it um, is, you know, really lean on our team. You know, we have, you know, we're separated into um, kind of, I mean, we all work together and everyone, you know, mm-hmm. chips in on on each sector, but, you know, we have kind of subject matter experts on securitized corporate bonds, rates, you know, uh, macro equities. Um, and so what we try and do is just try to clean out the, the most, the most interesting thing for that week. Um, so, you know, obviously in the month of September, um, real and real October, I mean, the, the biggest, um, piece of news and fixed income was the the rise in long-term interest rates. So we tried to address that. Um, last week, we also addressed, you know, mortgage-backed securities, like I mentioned. So I worked with our um, mortgage portfolio manager on that. Um, but, you know, we leverage internal research. We, we use, you know, um, s- some really good third-party research. I mean, and one area, one one outfit that I like to kind of point out, Variant Perception, um, they're they're really solid uh, in terms of independent research um, on a, on a macro level, but they do go down into kind of sector level um, um, recommendations and research as well. But you know, we we run the gamut. We use um, we use you know the sell side um, research houses and ultimately cross reference them, you know, with our view mm-hmm. um, and and kind of just try and always, um, you know, just for lack of a better word, you know, use it again, like cross reference to make sure that, you know, we are sound in our reasoning for a particular position for a particular view. Um, we're looking at the right things. We're not missing anything. And obviously that is a pursuit, you know, that lasts forever. Um, and when you're, when you're operating in markets, so, you know, we can, we're always doing that. So the way we communicate, with our within our investment team is you know we have a um a team meeting every single day um and around the open um where we we go around the horn we talk about um our market view um and and kind of any data points that have you know either added to it or you know detracted from it you know maybe there's an economic release that we want to talk about most of most days you're not really changing the view it's it's really just constant re-underwriting and if you think about it it's kind of just like practice it's just getting reps um on and just always staying in sync um and then we have our investment committee meetings that happens um every couple of weeks um which where we're really trying to you know set a firm wide view on the economy on policy on valuations um, on the larger strategy of of the firm, of which the portfolio team will then express in all of our all of our strategies. But ultimately, I think the key for us is just that constant communication, you know, informed by some of those um, sources I mentioned. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. I know we could continue this forever. At least I could. I uh, always love picking your brain. But um, we are going to wrap it up here. But I get to ask you one final question. We understand that every financial professional has their own take on certain concepts within the industry. And at Harbor, we're firm believers in active management. That being said, in a previous conversation we had, you mentioned that you believe active and passive are sort of made up categories and that there is more of a psychology involved. Would love to hear a little bit more about this. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think, you know, with money and in, in general and investing, um, there's always decisions that have to be made. Um, and I think, you know, passive investing versus active investing is sometimes used more, you know, and, and simplified to death. And it really is not specific enough. You know, sometimes you can be a passive investor, but choose the wrong index. So there's the decision there to kind of choose the vehicle, the index that you're invested in, um, you know, active, there's different levels of active. There's, you know, picking securities, there's factors, um, you know, and so, and different levels of turnover, you can be an act, you can have active risk. So I think, um, for, 
active versus passive, you know, you're always making a decision as an investor. You know, if you're starting your portfolio and you set a passive portfolio to earn 7%, and like I mentioned before, in 2015 versus today, you know, that's a decision. Your portfolio composition will probably look different. Um, and, you know, whether you choose to rebalance that or not is is really up to, you know, to to you and and your advisor and and consultant and things like that. But, um, you know, I think there's just always a decision to be made. Um, and I think especially when it comes to psychology, um, you want to pick a style um, that allows you to stay the course, you know, for as long as you can possibly can. So, um, you know, if you're if you're a passive investor, but you have the wrong risk profile, you know, during a huge drawdown, it could it could induce more pain than you you'd like, maybe causes some sort of um, you know behavior, maybe selling at a at a wrong point, things like that. So to me, it's it's a little deeper than that, and it's to me it's like indexed versus you know enhanced index. You know, there's there's more specificity that I think um, could be applied to this area. And I know I know it's like a lot of the discussion just takes place in the headlines and things like that, and you know no one is just like active versus passive and that's everything. But to me, sometimes I'm like, Oh, you know, what, what do you mean by passive? Because just like something that's more systematic that you can just set it, forget it could also still be active, you know, and um, in terms of the way it's constructed and does it match up with the client's objectives? Um, Does it, uh, does it help achieve someone's financial goals and does it allow them to stay the course? I think those are really important things to consider. I think that's a great point. I I think when you're choosing something, even maybe it's listed as passive, the stocks within that indice isn't, they aren't passive. And so as they're moving, you know, you, you really kind of do want to have that factor into your decision-making for, you know, for the longer term. Um, And we're going to end it there, but I would love to have, have you on maybe again in 2024. Um, Last but not least, how can people find you? What is your social and what's your website? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, that's that's my main kind of um, you know social media platform. You know, put out you know commentary. Um, again, really help write that weekly note for Sage. And then you can find Sage uh, Sage Advisory at our website uh, sageadvisory.com. Um, and we also you know put out some great kind of decks on a monthly basis. Um, you know, we really try and put our views out there really across markets, uh, fixed income, macro, ESG. Um, and so I highly recommend if anyone wants to follow us, just subscribe to our newsletters. And, uh, you know, it's, I think it's a lot of really good information. Oh, I agree. And definitely, you should definitely hit the uh, subscribe button. So now we're going on to my favorite part of the, uh, of the active advisor, which is 60 seconds with Compson. Let me know when you're ready, sir. Okay, I'm ready. Nickname? Ben's. Hobby? Martial arts. Hidden talent? I can cook really well. Favorite podcast? I love audiobooks. Favorite Texas sports team? Dallas Mavericks, for sure. Best part of your job? Best part of my job is that it, it's always changing and it's kind of a combination of a lot of different disciplines like math, econ, um, history, psychology, and there's an element of like human nature on top of all that. Profession, if you weren't in finance? Originally, I wanted to be a comedic writer. What advice would you give to your younger self? Be present in the moment. Most recent book you finished? Finding Ultra. Celebrity, living or dead, you'd most want to have dinner with? Any US president. Favorite way to get active? Well, I mentioned before I love martial arts. I've done like all different types of martial arts, like Muay Thai, um, boxing, you know, I'm doing capoeira and just running, just always doing something. 